Something I have done more this year than any year maybe of my whole life is binge watch TV shows. I've never really been a binge watcher. I kind of tend to watch the same things over and over again. But now that I hardly ever leave my house except for work things, I watch a lot of TV. I have a lot of recommendations for you if you'd like them. If you haven't watched Ted Lasso yet, you just have to watch Ted Lasso. It's one of my favorites. I have a lot of other favorites. Some of them maybe come with language warnings and things like that. There's a lot of good TV lately. When I was an adolescent, it was sort of the peak of reality television. And I've never been super into reality television, but it took off in a really big way in the early 2000s. And some of it lasted, most of it didn't. I did learn during quarantine that Real World Road Rules Challenge is still a thing, and so that was pretty exciting for me. But 2007 brought us a show that only existed in 2007, Kid Nation, the show where 40 children are sent to a privately owned town in New Mexico to create their own society, set up a government, and fend for themselves without adults. Some of you have heard me talk about this show before. I think it's the most fascinating thing. The children were ages 8 to 15, and they had to do everything themselves, from doing their own laundry to slaughtering their own dinner. And if they were lucky, they sometimes got rewarded with a sack full of buffalo nickels. CBS thought this show was a good idea. I mean, what could go wrong in this scenario? If you missed the one season show, because again, it only lasted one season, I assume child labor laws came into play, or who knows what other giant red flags. But it began with the children being taken to Bonanza, New Mexico, and being tasked with creating their own society. And this is part of what fascinates me about the show, is that Everyone, even kids, seem to know that there is a way you order society. And so through much debate, they come up with house rules and just some sort of guiding norms. They figure out how to get food. They participate in competitions for resources. Like on one show, they have to compete and then decide between either getting seven outhouses or one television. In the show, you see kids mimicking the way they've seen adults behave, both in real life and on other reality shows. The kids slam non-alcoholic beverages in the saloon. They have sugar hangovers that render them absolutely unable to get up for work on time. Episode four includes a religious debate between the children that nearly splits the town. In the finale, when the rules are abolished, the kids loot the stores, they steal fistfuls of candy and boxes of soda, and just generally run amok. But even the kids seem to know innately that there are certain rules to living life together, even though in the show they vigorously debate what they are. But they understand there are certain social contracts that everybody just abides by in order to make life work, but when the situation gets manipulated, they act the same way adults do. We are just as capable of descending into chaos and confusion and self-preservation, just as much as any kids would be, maybe more. We've maybe never seen that portrayed more powerfully than now as we debate whether or not we can follow basic public health guidelines. Now, this has always been the case. The whole story of humanity is a story of us trying to figure out how to live together Getting it right, getting it wrong, and hopefully on our better days, trying again. That's why this Lent we are talking about again and again. That God has to remind us again and again what it means that we belong to one another. So it's always been this way, and so we find some ways to govern life that will help us. That's where we are in the story today. So we've been talking about covenants, and God again and again makes covenant with us. In our story today, Moses comes down from the mountain and gives the people the rules from, of the covenant. So what are rules for? Is it so that God can get out of the deal if we don't hold up our end of the covenant? Adding rules to the covenant seems a little scary because it makes the covenant itself seem like it has conditions on it. And so especially for us who desperately need God's love to be different from human love, to have greater staying power and deeper compassion, this doesn't seem like a great development in our story. Now, if we look at the characters of the story, Moses himself was a murderer coming down the mountain with the tablets that say, thou shalt not murder. 
So that's probably a good clue that we don't have to obey the law perfectly to earn the promise of it. We know that isn't true. In fact, the whole story of the Bible is the story of God's covenant people failing to hold up their end. Even Jesus in our story today seems to know that some things are more important than the rules, and he breaks a whole lot of social norms, even for us today as he flips over tables at the temple. Even Jesus knows that rules are important, but they may not always be perfect. The promise doesn't void the law, but the law never voids the promise. The whole idea of the rules and the law is to give people a way of life that works and to make it at least somewhat more likely for them to be able to experience the joy and love and grace of the covenant that God made with them. So in the covenant with Moses, God says, here are 10 rules for the way that life works best. Now, most of us, whether we want to be or not, whether we would admit it or not, most of us are rules people. Everything has rules, whether they're written down or not. Nobody knows that better than kids. You know, a couple of years ago when we were studying the Ten Commandments, Katie asks the, asked the kids in children's church what they thought might be the ten rules that God has for us. And their ideas were fantastic. You can tell kids get in trouble a lot for cheating at games. There were a lot of things about not cheating at games. A lot of things about not wrecking the house. Um, my favorite one, and I really think they were just ahead of their time, was don't lick your hands. Five years ago, that seemed really funny. Now it's a really important rule. So we know there are rules. From the very beginning of our life, we know there are rules. There are rules in business, rules for social interaction. There are generational rules. Adhering to certain rules is how we navigate the world and how we learn new places and new people and try to figure out how life all fits together. Rules can be comforting. They help us know where the boundaries are. A group of kids in a fake New Mexico ghost town can do it. We can do it, and we do it all the time. I'm a rules person, at least to an extent, but I'm afraid that our understanding of rules sometimes makes it really hard to understand covenants. It seems like adult people, adult Christians, have a really hard time understanding what a covenant is because we're so used to rules. So it's especially hard for us to understand a covenant like this one where Moses comes and actually brings a whole new set of rules and makes it seem like a thing we can screw up. Whenever I ask people to tell me what a covenant is, they almost unfailingly every time describe a contract. Contracts are more familiar to us, right? Contracts are at the heart of America's founding documents. They are woven into the fabric of our culture. We have contracts for everything. They are so foundational to our lives, we barely notice them. And a working definition of a contract is that it is a voluntary agreement between two free agents that creates an obligation that can be enforced. And all the parts of that definition are important. You can probably all think of contracts you are party to. Maybe it's your employment, your mortgage, a car loan, a credit card, or those terms of agreement on iTunes that you never read but just click that you agree to. Those are contracts. And if they're broken, compensation can be expected. There are formal and informal ones, but they all work roughly the same way. And while contracts can be pretty dull to read, and as I talk, I think maybe a little bit dull to talk about too, they also bring a kind of relief, don't they? Especially for people like us who like to have some rules in order, it's reassuring to know that someone's thought about all of these things in advance. They've thought about what could go wrong and worked out a fair way of naming responsibilities and anticipating solutions to problems. That's really good news. And that brings us to the other, older language that goes back before there was ever a language to contracts, and it is the language of covenant. And we've been reading about covenants for a few weeks now. We've read about God's covenant with Noah, God's covenant with Abraham and Sarah. The whole dynamic of the Old Testament story is of whether God will be faithful to these covenants, even if Israel breaks them. Is the covenant somehow conditional? 
is a question at the heart of the text. Does it fail if Israel doesn't perform well? How will, how will God restore Israel when the covenant is in tatters? This is the question on which the whole Bible rests, friends. And to know the answer, we have to be clear about the difference between contracts and covenants. Contracts cover limited matters and are a way of keeping them under control. By contrast, covenants are about powers that we can never really hope to control. And that's why when we look at the most precious things in our lives, we find they're run by covenants and not contracts. Who will be holding your hand when you die? That's not something you can put in a contract. That's about a covenant. Who do you turn to when you're at a crossroads in your life and you have no idea what to do next? You go to someone you trust in a way no contract could guarantee. What gives you a sense of community and belonging and being understood and at home? Well, it's a group of people and a place with whom you share a covenant. A contract can't give you that. One of the differences between a contract and a covenant is that the signatories to a contract always have a third party to whom they can appeal if something goes south with the contract. But there's no compensation for the breaking of a covenant because a covenant wasn't a means to some more useful end. A covenant, be it between partners or friends or family members or churches or neighbors, is the end unto itself. If it's over, there's no consolation prize to make it better. But if it lasts, it may be the most tangible sign of God's abundant provision that we can experience on earth. Now, as Christians, we should be people who take contracts seriously. The rules matter, and it's a recognition that life is full of unexpected pitfalls, and it's a way of holding one another to honesty and honor in the face of temptation or distraction. Contracts are good, but we never can assume to run our whole life by contracts, by things that say, if you do this, then I'll do this. If we do, we'll find us ourselves unprepared for the deepest and most beautiful things God has to give us. Instead, we try to turn our contracts slowly but surely into covenants. Contracts can give us security and trust, but only covenants can bring joy and delight. Now, perhaps most important in all this talk about contracts and covenants is the reminder never to treat our relationship with God as a contract. This can be our greatest error, friends, in walking with God. We never made a deal. God doesn't owe us anything. We aren't God's equal. And there's no court of arbitration we can go to if we get it into our head that God is not keeping up the divine end of, this, of the bargain. In time everlasting, which is God's time, there is no contract. Now, this is incredibly good news for us who are in the season of Lent where we may have already failed at any attempted disciplines. It's good news for us because though we like rules, or at least we like the idea of them for other people, if nothing else, we're not great at keeping them. What we have with God is a covenant. It's a covenant of grace we did nothing to earn or deserve. It's not conditional on our ability. It does not depend on our performance. In fact, every time we break it or get it wrong, God just takes on more of it, more of the responsibility on to God's self. Even the law, the rules for life with God, are not a list of possible errors or pitfalls. The Psalms tell us that the law of God revives our souls that it gives us life, it invites us deeper into the covenant that God has offered us. It invites us deeper into grace and love and hope and new life. Friends, in the end, all our contracts will fade away. But our covenants, our covenants will last. And the promise is that our covenant with God will endure forever and ever and that we will be reminded of it again and again every time we need to be. And that is a covenant we can trust. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.